Good morning and welcome to the Rainham Channel, Cranberry Country Chronicles. I'm Doug Bingham. I'm here with Scott Day of Pro Project Gurnet Light, Project Bug Light here in Duxbury, Massachusetts. Uh, we're here today to take a look around uh, the Gurnet Point, as it's called, so named uh, after a fish, so I understand, that was uh, and still is native to the Gurnet area of the coast of England. This is a very historic piece of property where once there was a farm, there's a life-saving station nearby that is fully restored. Uh, we have this 1842 lighthouse. Uh, we're going to go up in one of the mounds eventually here and give you a panoramic view of this incredible area, which is at the mouth of Plymouth Bay. This is an area that generally is not open to the public. Uh, you do need permission to get out here. However, there are certain opportunities during the year time that you can come out here, uh, courtesy of Project Bug Light, Project Gurnet Light, and enjoy what this area has to offer in terms of solitude, silence, and just absolute beauty. Uh, there are postings on the internet on their website and also in Lighthouse Digest magazine, I believe, mm -hmm. yep. uh, which will tell you how to get out here, who to contact, and when the opening dates are for this particular area. This is at the end of a four-mile long stretch of Duxbury Beach that's heavily patrolled. It's also a wildlife sanctuary out here. It's not hard to imagine that during the winter time there are many types of birds which seek refuge here, primarily snowy owls. They're not uncommon here on Duxbury Beach during the winter, coming down from the Arctic to find food. And there's plenty of it here in the form of birds, mice, rabbits, and other types of small game that these owls look for. We're going to uh, take the camera now and uh, show you some of the area such as it is. We're going to show you this beautiful 1842 lighthouse. It's the oldest freestanding wooden lighthouse. United States. Okay, it's the oldest uh, freestanding wooden lighthouse in the U.S., yeah. And it, it formerly had, there were twin lights out here, and we'll talk about that also. So we're going to walk across over here to Old Fort Andrew, which is a Revolutionary War fortress, which is still here. The mounds, which the, the, or the earthen berms that uh, provided the defense walls for this fortress here are still here. So we're going to roam around this ground and show you exactly what we have here and what there is to see and appreciate here at the Gurnet Point. So, how about we take a walk? Let's walk. We're on top of one of the earthen mounds which originally supported the twin lighthouses that were out here. Right now there's only one. In fact, there will only be one for the remainder of its life. Uh, that is until the Coast Guard decides yeah, when and if they decide that this is no longer feasible or they don't want it anymore which is all the more reason why there is a preservation group out here uh, caring for this structure and the uh, grounds around it. I'm going to let Scott uh, talk more about that and um, have at it. Our group, uh, Project Gurnet and Bug Light, we are um, a nonprofit group that uh, our sole responsibility is to take care of the lighthouses. This light here, Gurnet, and uh, Bug Light, uh, out behind me in the middle of the harbor. Um, our job is just to maintain all the properties, the light, two lighthouses, and, uh, the uh, keeper's cottage. Uh, we rent out the keeper's cottage and we use 100% uh, of all the money for, uh, for uh, maintaining the properties. I mean, we mow the lawn, we reshingle the lighthouse and the, the house and repaint the uh, uh, bug light. I mean, we've for the last five years we've uh, basically gone through all the properties and rebuilt everything. But being in this environment, we've always got uh, more work to do. Okay, as we were talking on the uh, way out here, this entire community is off the grid. There's no running water out here. There's no municipal water supply. No electricity. No telephone lines. So you really have to be self-sufficient. Which brings to mind the question, what is this gigantic piece of equipment over here? That there is a uh, solar panel. Uh, the granite light, uh, the light itself, and the foghorn. Uh, I believe it's about 
about 800 watts of power that it produces. It charges batteries that are located in the uh, in the, uh, the lighthouse. The batteries are charged, uh, and at that time the light turns on automatically and, and goes until the morning. Amazing. I know that uh, I heard about a solar collector up on Machias, uh, Maine, where the Matinicus Rock is, about 15, 20 miles offshore, and they say that even on a gray, cloudy day like this, it'll still collect enough energy to keep the lights and the fog signal burning. Yep, yep. The, the, uh, as long as the sun shines somewhat, they're... Okay, I'm going to ask Alan to pan the camera while we talk a little bit. Uh, right next to us is an amazing formation that I'm familiar with, having been associated with one of the earlier groups that cared for this property. Uh, this is um, the foundation of the old second lighthouse, if I'm correct. That's correct. This, uh, this foundation uh, was of the, the lighthouse, uh, the twin lighthouse that was taken down. Um, back in the uh, early 1900s, the government, uh, the Lighthouse Service, was trying to conserve funds and they decided to start taking down twin lights, fe uh, feeling that they weren't necessary and, and actually some of the ships passing by uh, had indicated that, you know, uh, the further off they got, they just, the, the twin lights just looked like one light, so yeah. the, uh, the importance of having two lights, they, they, didn't, they didn't think it was important. And without getting too technical about that aspect of it, and that, I believe that was primarily because the Fresnel lens that uh, so many people are familiar with that makes these lighthouses operate wasn't available in many communities um, for quite a number of years, even after they were first being manufactured in the 1820s. I think um, Baker's Island up in Salem, Massachusetts and Beverly Harbor it's a classic example. I know they got their Fresnel lens somewhere in the early 1920s. Is that the case here? I think the, uh, the first Fresnel lens, I think, came in the 20s, and they upgraded it to the uh, fourth order Fresnel lens, and that was in the late 30s. Yeah. And that was the last Fresnel lens that we had here. Matter of fact, folks, you can see the original lens that was in this tower. It's at another location just up the coast in the town of Hull at the Hull Life Saving Museum, right on Nantasket Avenue. It's on display on the second floor there, and it's called a bivalve because it looks like a clam, a very large clam in its uh, shape. A very, it's one of the few bivalve lenses we had here in New England. And I noticed, too, that many of the homes around here have wind turbines to supplement their power. Yep, they use a, uh, a combination of uh, solar power, uh, wind power. We've got an average wind here of about 14 miles an hour, which is uh, ideal for uh, small wind turbines. And um, and then everybody also has a backup generator, gas power, or diesel powered uh, generator to uh, to supplement when those uh, have, uh, days of no wind and no sun. Now, I also noticed, too, that from this particular vantage point, I'm going to cup my microphone here so that the wind doesn't affect it too much. Uh, we can see the nuclear power plant over in Manomet on the other side of the harbor, on the south side of Plymouth Harbor, to be exact. And right behind Allen, we have a strange object that is co connected with that. Let's take a look at that, too, so people can get an idea of what we have here and what this is for. That also has a solar collector on it. So what would you call this? That is a, uh, it's an alarm system for the nuclear power plant. If there is an issue over there, this alarm will, uh, will uh, be set off and it, uh, uh, it warns us of uh, danger. It's all powered by, the, uh, by solar and it, there's batteries. You can see the boxes, those, uh, uh, 
Uh, those have batteries in it, and you can see the antenna, so it's all controlled by radio. Um, they come out uh, periodically to test it. It's, uh, it's an eyesore, but it serves its purpose. Okay. And I noticed, too, since the last one of the last times I was out here, and it's been several years, that um, up here on the top of the stairway, which overlooks the bluff, uh, which we'll get a look at also a little bit later, uh, there was the remains of an old concrete observation tower. So was that part of the old coastal defense system? Yep, it was. It was put in back uh, during World War II, and it was used as a submarine lookout tower. Um, it was uh, it was used all through World War II, and and after that, it was primarily boarded up for years and years. And when the Coast Guard moved this uh, moved the lighthouse back, they had uh, taken down that that uh, tower. Okay, so it was physically removed. I I thought maybe it went over the blu the bluff. No, no, it didn't. Uh, the Coast Guard took it down before it. Did that. Yeah, I know. We come down here quite frequently during the summer months on the lighthouse cruise that I operate out of Boston Harbor uh, with Boston Harbor Cruises and this is one of the spots we take a look at. We stopped the boat here about two or three hundred yards out to get a look and uh, I do my best to explain what's going on up here and a lot of first time people who come down here are totally enthralled with this particular location. I mean they scramble for the rails and they, to get the best photo uh, vantage point uh, because this is such an unusual place. And I notice also that, uh, again, if Alan turns around and pans the camera out there on the horizon, we can see two liquid natural gas tankers, one leaving Boston Harbor and one coming into it. Uh, I didn't realize until this time here just how well we can see them from this point here. And I know that also on a good clear day from the top of the bluff over here, we can see uh, Race Point. Yep, P Town. Yeah, Pro Provincetown. Uh, yeah, very clearly too. It's uh, it's amazing how uh, how clear you can see it. Yeah, those barges are heading for um, the Cape Cod Canal. Yep. They'll run through the canal to get to the south side of the Cape Cod. I know at least one of them is kind of hidden behind the house, uh, which is in, immediately in front of us. It is a liquid natural gas tanker, though. That, that's, that thing is huge. Amazing ships. Okay, we're going to take a walk around the um, old Fort Andrew here and get down into a lower place where the wind isn't so bad and you can, we can be heard a little better. So let's take a walk down the stairway. Okay, here we are. We're down a little, few degrees in elevation and the wind has abated a little bit because of it. We're not quite so exposed. Uh, we're looking down into Old Fort Andrew, this is a Revolutionary War era fortress which was a defense site for Plymouth Harbor and for the town of Duxbury being given the fact that rather the opening to Plymouth Harbor is right here off to my left and right behind Allen. Uh, this fortress here defended uh, again once again Plymouth Kingston and uh, Duxbury and the first keeper here was John Thomas with his wife Hannah. That's correct. Like, tell us a little bit about them. Well, they were the first lighthouse keepers out here. They owned the property, um, and the, the government paid them a small amount of money to uh, put up the lighthouses, and, and then they paid them to, uh, to monitor them and maintain them and keep them lit. And John Thomas went off to serve during the American Revolution. He did. He did, and when he did that, his wife took over, and she uh, she uh, kept the lights lit for years while he was gone. Hmm. Her name was Hannah, of course. Yeah, we mentioned it before, but and I just learned recently that he served at Dorchester Heights. Mm -hmm. Now that's uh, an important spot that I mentioned on our lighthouse cruises as we leave Boston Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the point where the colonials set up the guns that had been seized from Fort Ticonderoga in the winter of 1775. Mm -hmm. They dragged those cannons across the mountains of uh, Lower Vermont, the Berkshires of Massachusetts, and the foothills of the Worcester area to bring them to Boston. Mm -hmm. They set them there in Dorchester Heights of what is now South Boston, and that's where John Thomas served. Yep. And I just learned recently, again, that um, at the encampment they had, smallpox broke out and it spread rapidly, and he uh, fell victim to that. So Hannah Thomas officially became the first 
woman, female lighthouse keeper in U.S. history. Yep. That's amazing, and it happened right here. Mm -hmm. Now, this um, area here, as I understand it, when I was with the Friends of Garnet Light back in the late 1980s and early 90s, uh, there were cannons here, and there was a long-held thought that maybe they might have been buried below some of these mounds, but yeah, I understand they, there was some digging here to disprove that. Right. The, uh, there was always the rumor that they were buried here in one of the mounds, and the Coast Guard over the years said uh, the government had come in and x-rayed the mounds to see what was inside of them, and they came up with nothing. So. Yeah. But you know, we had hopes. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was interesting. You know? I, I was out here watching them Something one day. Something to talk yeah. about. And, yeah. You know, it was... yeah. But uh, this, again, okay, so um, during the Revolution, there was a British frigate called the Niger, N-I-G-E-R, that was trying to enter Plymouth Harbor, and according to Scott here, they sought an anchorage just outside of Long Point, which is the entrance to Plymouth Harbor and right along the entrance of Duxbury Bay. And what happened between the Colonials and the Frigate Niger, or the Brig Niger, maybe? The Brigate, right. The Frigate. Uh, it was a, uh, the Colonials, uh, the militia back then, uh, was trying to protect uh, the harbor as they thought, and they took a shot at the ship, and the ship uh, returned fire and, and hit one of the lighthouses. And, that was, uh, that yeah. was the end of the skirmish. Yeah, we don't really know if that's legend or truth, but sometimes a legend is larger than the truth. Right. And right. people generally go with the legends all too often, so yeah. we'll just let that be. Now, there was another British ship, the General Arnold, um, sometime during the Revolution that it was out here, according to what I've read. And Plymouth Harbor was pretty well frozen over. There were some pretty heavy ice flows out here. And the ship was stuck on the ice, and according to some of the history that is written, the residents of the three towns here, Plymouth, Kingston, Duxbury, built a causeway out there to rescue the remainder of the stranded sailors who hadn't succumbed to hypothermia or drowning. Yeah. I, I can't imagine the conditions they must have worked under if that was indeed the case. A lot of brave people back then. But in any event, all throughout here, as we're panning the camera, you can see some of the earthen mounds from left to right. There were buildings in here that served as barracks, officers' quarters. Uh, there must have been a powder house at one time yep. to store the gunpowder for the cannons and the rifles and whatever am other ammunition. Uh, they stored them in one of the mounds. One of the was mounds so was hollowed out, and uh, they stored it inside the mound. Oh, okay. Oh, very good. Interesting. It's not there anymore, and the mound is actually caved in. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, over time, yeah. Yeah, and this area is um, also prone to a lot of erosion. Yes, yep. We've lost a lot of the shoreline here over the years. In the last 30 years, we've probably lost 25, 30 feet of uh, shoreline here. Wow. It's. Uh, and that's not because of water out. action? Uh, it's because of rain. It's all, there's a lot of factors. Yeah. And, you know. Not sure if anybody Rainfall really leaching knows. through the ground in the, the air. Rain hits the edge and it, it carries dirt down. We have some ocean erosion and we, we lose large chunks of uh, of land from the ocean. Yeah. A big storm will come in. And I know on the bluff out here to Allen's right, that's an area that's really especially prone to erosion. Yeah. During the blizzard of '78, we lost uh, almost 15 feet of, uh, of land off of the, the head of the Gurney. Hmm. Wow. A lot of the residents have um, have uh, built the uh, stone seawalls on their property. Yeah. The only there's only three properties left that haven't done it. One, the government property here, and then two other properties. So everybody else has been been building the stone seawalls uh, to hold the uh, ocean back. It's been pretty effective. Well, I hope so, because I noticed there are, there are a few that are really close to the edge over here. Yes, there are. Especially on the uh, Cape Cod Bay side. Yeah, right yeah. behind you, there's a couple that are very, very close. Yeah. Yeah, might I add, not only is this, this the entrance of Plymouth Harbor, but if you look at it from the reverse, this is the entrance to Cape Cod Bay. Just 18 to 20 miles across is Provincetown, uh, Truro, and Wellfleet. Uh, again, they're very clear on a very clear day. Today, we have a little bit of cloud and showers on the area, but uh, we've been fortunate here. Okay, let's move on and uh, we'll take the camera inside and 
show you some of this very, very interesting, uniquely handmade lighthouse. Okay, we are inside the 1842 lighthouse here at the Gurnet Point. Uh, we mentioned earlier that this was one of two twin lights that stood here up till about 1923, I believe it was. 1924. 24, thank you. I knew I was close. Yep. <laughs> um, as we take you folks on some of these uh, journeys by cable TV, uh, you will notice that I tend to gravitate toward the water in communities that are on the water. And it's not my wish that you be as informed about lighthouse history as I am. Rather, we want to show you some of these lighthouses and their own history, how the communities around them evolved, how the ports developed, who were the primary people in making those ports important, about some of the defense sites um, that we have taken you to uh, already, in such as Situate, um, Fort Tabor down in New Bedford, and now here we are at Fort Andrew at the entrance to Plymouth and Duxbury Bays. My intention is to also show some of you folks the architectural history of some of these sites and tell you about the people who made these structures possible. Each and every tower has its own story. It's not necessarily about the tower itself as much as it is about the people who were here, who built these, who maintained these, and the histories of the towns around them. And I think that is really at, at, at the core of what is really important about this facet of history. It's often said that if you take one lighthouse and you study the history of the community around it and the tower itself, the people who staffed it, you'll be able to study the history of the United States of America from the inception of that particular lighthouse tower up to the present year. You'll go through every presidential administration, every congressional um, meeting that ever occurred, uh, every individual who headed up an office, whether it be the Department of Transportation, the Department of Commerce, Department of the Treasury, and other governmental agencies that oversaw the properties that these towers stand on. It's a fascinating, fascinating way of learning American history uh, without going into any boring lengths. Uh, there's such history on this site alone that started with the American Revolution. Uh, in fact, the, the story of these towers preceded that. Um, it's, it's just a fascinating place, which brings me to the point where Scott and I are at right now. We're going to talk about who made this tower. It was not necessarily one person, but rather a body of people. So where does that take us, Scott? Well, it takes us to uh, 1842 when they, uh, they uh, decided that they needed to replace the old towers that were here. They had uh, fallen in disrepair and um, beyond repair. And they came up with this design and they, uh, they hired the local shipbuilders to come out and, uh, and erect these structures. They built the, uh, the twin lights and at the time they also built a keeper's cottage which was a colonial, uh, one family colonial at the time and uh, that's what they built. And that, but that one family colonial evolved into a duplex because you required more than one keeper here. Correct, yeah. correct. Later on, I don't, I don't have the dates on when they had uh, added the, uh, the apartment on it, but they had uh, turned it into a duplex and uh, the assistant keeper stayed here also. And again, my favorite keeper. <laughs> you know, people often ask me, what's my favorite lighthouse? I don't have a favorite lighthouse, but I have a favorite keeper. Mm -hmm. And his name was Milton Ramey. Mm -hmm. And it's all the more important to me and all the more curious to me that the Project Garnet and Bug Light, as you corrected me to say, thank you for that, um, comes into play here. You're taking care of two of the most important lighthouses, I think, here in the Cape Cod Bay region. Yep. And Milton Ramey was one of the first keepers at the Iron Bug Light, just a short distance away. And after his term ended there, he came over here. And I remember his granddaughter, 
Her name is Millie Liddington. Mm -hmm. She and her two or three sisters uh, shared memories one time with me, and I have it on tape, about visiting out here and how they had to walk four miles over the sand. And if not for that powder point bridge, it would have been an even longer walk, an extra seven miles to be exact. That, that powder point bridge we came across saves you seven miles instead of having to drive all the way up in a marsh field and then take the, the sand and gravel road down here. You can use that powder point bridge, the longest uncovered wooden bridge in North America to uh, access this point. And it's only a four mile trip across the uh, sand and gravel. So uh, Milton Ramey went from here, and then he went to the mine at Ledge. Then he went to the International Exposition at Chicago. He returned to the mine at Ledge Light, where he served out his time until 1915. Then his son Octavius took his place. And as I mentioned to you a little earlier off camera, the uh, burial sites for the Ramey family are just over here in Plymouth, behind the Pilgrim Church. Yep. There are four or five light keepers side by side. All part of the family, including one brother-in-law, yep. which is all the more special. That uh, between the, I think the four or five of them, they have almost uh, seventy plus years in the lighthouse service. Wow, that's commendable. That, that's yeah. that's remarkable. That could one do. family yep. could do that. Yeah. Wow. So if you take the camera in here, uh, we're going to pan it around, and while Scott and I talk a little bit about uh, the structural interior of this tower which is absolutely beautiful. It's all hand cut timber, no machinery involved. You can see the uh, odd shapes on the uprights. You can see the uh, irregular surfaces on the, uh, the joints, on the studs that frame the walls. Um, it's almost as if it looks like the interior of a ship's hull. It does. It does. With the braces and the way they're angled and the way they're joined together. It's beautiful joinery and I, I believe it's all hand pegged as well. There might be a few nails that uh, make up some of the structure and the iron bolts which put together uh, many of the uprights into the beams in the floor joists overhead. I mean, this, yeah. this structure is overbuilt. Oh yes. It re really overbuilt, and it's just, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful, and yep. I often wish every time I've ever been in here that I could see it unpainted mm -hmm. to appreciate it all the more. But the Coast Guard has ways of painting everything white. Yeah. <laughs> yep, they did. When they moved it, they had painted it. That is their color. <laughs> so. Oh, th this is magnificent. And to get it on video for the first time, to my knowledge, for a cable TV station is even better. I noticed there were even a few slots here that used to have some type of joinery in here, but I guess it was just unnecessary for those. Yeah. I'll get out of the way so you can pan, Alan. And here you can get a look at the battery of banks. Uh, gosh, I'll pan. get my time. The bank of batteries that connect to the solar collector outside and the circuit box is behind the stairs. Yep. And if it's I'm correct, this stairway is original. Maybe. Yeah, I believe it is. I believe it is original. Yeah, it kind of looks like the stairways inside the Three Sisters at Nosset. Yeah. Pretty much the same joinery, too. Over there, there's the uh, main battery bank. Behind it is all the control panels that monitor the batteries and shut the charging down when the batteries are fully charged and there's an antenna here it sends a signal up to Boston if there's an issue if there's any malfunction uh, hmm. Boston gets a signal and then they'll come out and uh, repair it I see it's a high frequency antenna very short yep yeah and behind me we got the backup batteries in case something happens with those oh okay so we have an auxiliary battery uh, backup great now does the electronic tone or the foghorn is that still working uh, it's on the next floor. Up, uh, there's a, uh, it's a sensor. It sends out a signal. I'm not exactly sure how far, a mile or so, and, and if it sees its signal back, it, uh, if it doesn't see its signal, then it'll, it'll turn on, on yeah. the, uh, the fog horns and they'll just start blowing away until, uh, until the signal uh, mm. is seen again. I know at Boston Light there's a, a fog signal there, 
and sometimes the fog signal operates when it's not necessary. We do have that from time to time. Just last week out on Bug Light, it was going off for over a week. And well, Boston has uh, an anomaly offshore. They call it the Ghost Walk. Yeah. Uh, just due east of Boston Light, mm -hmm. there is an area out there that if you're navigating in that specific angle coming toward the lighthouse, almost due east, mm -hmm. and there is fog, you won't hear the fog signal. Mm -hmm. You may be only 100 yards away, but you won't hear it. Yep. But if you get two degrees to the right or two degrees to the left of your course, yep. then you can hear the fog signal. Mm. There's a dead area out there, and then nobody can explain it. Yeah, We have a similar thing here, too. Do you? I was out a couple years ago... Uh, checking my lobster pots and the fog rolled in on me and and uh, the fog horn started and I, I could not tell you what direction it was coming from or or I could just faintly hear it and I had to sit and wait out the fog so wow that's amazing wow well let's go upstairs and uh, take a look at the second landing and see what we have to talk about up there all right we're up here in the lantern room of the old Gurnet lighthouse this is an iron lantern room, as most of them are here in North America. There are still a couple of wooden lantern rooms in other states. Uh, Avery Point down on the University of Connecticut campus, for example, which is down at uh, New London, Connecticut, on the mouth of the Thames River. This is a modern-day Fresnel lens, which I think you've already caught on camera, Alan. And these operate on what might be an equivalent of a five watt bulb. Sort of what you put on your Christmas tree or the, the candle, the electric candles you put in your windows. And it's hard to believe. But these Fresnel lenses that are in here are made by a New Zealand Corporation. Most of them anyway. I don't know about this particular one. But most of them are made in New Zealand now. And with the surgically precise cuts that they make in these lenses in a circular fashion with concentric circles uh, of course graduating from very very narrow bands to very wide bands in the center these narrow bands on the top and the bottom gather and refract and reflect this light and the beam is emitted through the center of each lens here this has a double white flash with about a 20 second eclipse or thereabouts uh, dark section that is and above it is a standby light uh, This comes on if the main light below fails and again This is powered by an equivalent of about a 5 watt light and again these prisms up on the top and the bottom collect light Bend it and refract it and then it's emitted through a wide band here in the center This is the focal plane where my finger is this is the focal plane. This is where the light or the height of the lens or the tower itself is actually measured. This is where the beam is emitted uh, in, in the event of a failure of the revolving optic. This will flash on and off, giving the same uh, flashing sequence. And of course, any heat that is created here during the summer or be, that might be emitted from the lens itself, which of course is highly unlikely because it's only a very low watt bulb. The, any heat is allowed to escape through a vent here at the very top. And oddly enough, most of the ventilation balls you see on the lighthouses around here that have been restored or are being restored, the model for these ventilation balls is the ventilation ball on top of the Minot Ledge Lighthouse. That's an interesting point that I never knew until I talked with our friend Joe Lebhertz, who was a maintainer or maintenance man for the U.S. Coast Guard four lighthouses during his career. So uh, we have a cast iron model of that ventilator ball available from where copies can be made for further restoration of other towers. But from here you get a magnificent um, view for 360 degrees of this stretch of the Cape Cod coastline. This is the west side of Cape Cod Bay over to uh, Allen's left and my right and where Scott is standing. And of course, we can see the nuclear power plant. You can see the Miles Standish Memorial over here in Duxbury, which was built as a tourist attraction many, many years ago when the Miles Standish Hotel was still standing over in that direction. That was an area of Duxbury called the Nook. And that is where Miles Standish had his farm. 
once he departed the Plymouth Bay Colony. And of course, Elder William Brewster lived over there, and John Alden lived over there, Priscilla Mullinsby, who became his wife, lived over there, and they were all buried in a common burying ground in Duxbury Center, near the site of the first meeting house in Duxbury, Massachusetts. So is there anything that you guys do up here, Scott, that is required as part of your contract with the Coast Guard and the GSA? Um, not really. We you know, wash the windows once in a while, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Coast Guard is responsible for man maintaining the age to navigation piece of the light, which means the lights themselves, the batteries, the solar power, and the lantern room. So we're going to be working with them here very shortly to uh, put a coat of paint on the lantern room mm. and uh, fix a few leaks. The windows are all leaking a little bit, so. That's a never-ending problem. Project. Yeah, <laughs> never ends out here. Yeah, I know that uh, virtually every group that has custody of a lighthouse has water leakage somewhere, and it seems like the more you cock, the more the leaks happen. Yep. yep. And you can't find out just where or why it's happening, but it's a never-ending battle. I imagine the early keepers themselves must have had a huge supply of window putty available yep. for that purpose to stop leaks. But then again, with the wind blowing the way it is up here uh, virtually every day of the year, it's no wonder that water finds its way in somewhere. Like they say, water seeks its own level. It does. When it hits an object, it's got to go somewhere. <laughs> but I notice we have an iron escape hatch. Yep. And we do have um, an area over here where there's one of several different um, half oval openings, but this one has a slot. So I would imagine that in the early days when the Fresnel lens was here, that was where the clockwork mechanism's weights uh, uh, rose and fell from this point. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's where they, they went all the way down to the bottom level. They could wind the, uh, the uh, light up from the lower level. Mm. They still had to come up here to, to light the light. Do you folks happen to have a, a model of a, uh, the clockwork mechanism in your collections? No, we don't. Hmm. We'll have to see what we can do about that. Mm. They, they do float around from time to time. I know a couple of groups that have uh, old working models. Matter of fact, I think the Situate Historical Society just had one come into their custody. Oh, really? Yeah. Rather decrepit, but it's looking for someone to restore it. <laughs> Yeah. Now this is um, an absolutely fascinating spot to be uh, up here in the lantern room of the oldest freestanding wooden lighthouse. It is totally handcrafted. Uh, the only one of its type in North America. There are many wooden lights throughout the country, but uh, this one is totally unique and this one has more history behind it. Uh, matter of fact, uh, while we're up here, we can pan the camera over and you can just see the cupola of the Gurnet Point Life Saving Station over there. That was part of the former United States Life Saving Service. Uh, chief um, Operating Officer was Sumner Kimball, who was a native of, uh, I believe, Maine. Uh, to be exact, I believe he came from the area of Gray, Maine. I, in fact, I just located his burial site uh, via the internet just a few weeks ago while I was researching another project. Uh, he oversaw life-saving stations all along the Atlantic coast, the Gulf Coast, and some of the Great Lakes for a good many years, up until 1915, when the U.S. Coast Guard uh, assimilated the life-saving service into their department, and it officially became the United States Coast Guard. Uh, the, here they had a large whale boat that was mounted on a heavy trailer. In fact, that whale boat and that trailer, which is, the, the boat is motorized, by the way, um, is still on display over there. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get in the building today, but uh, the building is laid out so that it looks as if the crew just stepped away. It's just an amazing thing. The oil skin uniforms are there, the, the, the beds they slept on, the, the desk, the head keeper or head lifesaver would have worked from with all his log books and all of his accounting books. Uh, they had a lot to keep account for. Um, everything was there. Uh, the, the hats, the medals, the, all the equipment they needed to a, aid in the um, event of a shipwreck. Everything they needed to go out there. By the way, their motto was, 
you have to go out, but nobody said you had to come back. And there were many lifesavers who lost their lives in the line of duty. Uh, there's just too many events to remember, but um, these were men who were very brave. They worked from November through almost May, uh, pre predominantly the winter months when shipwrecks were prone to happen along these coasts. And there were more than a few shipwrecks along this coastline here from the Gurnet Point all the way to Marshfield. And uh, they, in fact, all the way down to the Cape Cod Canal. And it was their duty to affect rescue for, a, uh, for any shipwreck vessels uh, that happened between Marshfield and the Cape Cod Canal. These guys had sometimes had to row six to eight miles to get to the scene of a wreck. So um, this is another spot for you folks to visit. Come out to the Garnet sometime. Check uh, Lighthouse Digest online at lighthousedigest.com or get hold of Project Garnet and Bug Light on the web. Just Google the words Project Bug Light or Project Garnet Light, either one, and you'll come to their page and it'll be loaded with information on how, about how to become a part of the group, when the open houses are, how you can help in maintaining this beautiful, wonderful historical location. And uh, if you don't want to get involved, come out and visit when the opportunity presents itself. Thanks very much for watching.